Good afternoon. This is the House Judiciary Committee non-civil. We've got several bills on the agenda. Uh, a revised agenda was sent electronically. Uh, we're going to postpone consideration of House Bills 671 and 771 until a future meeting. Those are still being worked on. But we'll go. We've still got an extensive agenda, so we'll get going on that. Let me ask. Um, uh, let me call House Bill 985, Mr. Kirby. Do we? And members, you should have a sub LC twenty nine five nine seven zero S. LC 295970S. Mr. Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I, I bring you House Bill 985 today. Uh, what this bill does is it's addressing a, uh, a gap really in, in our felony laws where we've had situations where people have uh, broken into empty, vacant properties, foreclosed properties, uh, some owned by citizens. And they have then forged a quick claim deed to themselves, and with that deed, been able to get basically uh, everything they need to rent that property out, uh, or whatever else they want to do with it. In the uh, the sub you've got there, we've also gone as far as as we've got. Uh, uh, or BJ did some excellent work in the past on on protecting public officials. This this one expands it to all citizens. And also, we've added in here um, the ability to to not just deal with titles and clouds on titles, but all, all sorts of documents where we've had situations where uh, uh, somebody in a retaliatory mood, mode put uh, uh, a district attorney in bankruptcy by forging bankruptcy paperwork. And this would make all these a felony to knowingly false make false documents that would do those type of activities. Uh, other than that, it's pretty simple, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Before that, let me go ahead and ask for a report from the subcommittee chair, Mr. Pack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we had a couple hearings on this bill, and each time I think uh, we were getting some input. Just a little back. Uh, I'm sorry I missed, you, uh, missed the beginning of your presentation. Um, the the section that 1610-20-1 um, is a new section to address a specific problem where law enforcement were being targeted. And, I, and I'm glad that Representative Kirby has kind of uh, broadening that that additional penalty provision to include uh, um, various owners of property who's been defaulted, uh, not defaulted, but defrauded by uh, these individuals who um, who squat. And um, basically, we're, what we're doing is we're expanding on the language that we had last year to cover everyone else, and now the maximum penalty is up to 10 years. Um, and um, I think it's a good bill. And uh, we received a unanimous due pass recommendation from the subcommittee. Appreciate the vice chairman's work on it. Uh, questions for the author, Ms. Dick uh, Ms. Kendrick. Oh, thank you. Um, I recently heard in the news about um, some people who were filing, I guess, claims in court and then saying that they had a house for rent, but they actually didn't own the house. Um, does this do anything to help those people? It. it this addresses the people that have taken possession of that house that do not own it because right now there's not a clear statute and they're having to try to piece together different charges to for those people that have squatted or, or uh, stolen occupancy is, is what I keep saying. They've stolen occupancy of the house. Um, there was been cases filed where, where they actually tried using some of the uh, racketeering RICO statutes and, and after the defendant said, you know, I didn't steal anything, the house is still there, they were actually acquitted. Uh, it's just making it very clear to give our prosecutors a very clear felony statute so these people that are stealing that occupancy of that property can be charged properly. Any further questions for the author? <coughs> Mr. Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you could, uh, and forgive me for not having um, spent more time with us in subcommittee, I wasn't present when it came through. Um, walk me through what the threshold is that triggers a felony under under this. If, if someone moves into a, say they're a squatter, they move into a house that's that's vacant, they occupy it for X amount of time, 
what behavior triggers felony treatment? When they knowingly make the false document, when they, they, they write that quick claim deed to themselves and they're forging the true owner's signature, when they're, they're, that's when they're committing the felony. When they know and file that, because right now they, 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 they can break into a foreclosed house, let's say it's bank owned. And what they've been doing, and there's a there's one group that's actually formed an LLC here in the Atlanta area. They've got 18 properties they've confiscated, basically, through this process. They go in, they file a quick claim deed, forging the name of the owner. And sometimes it's not even the, the rightful owner because the bank maybe has already taken it back. They take it to the clerk of the courts. They stamp it and, and process it. That's, only, that's the only responsibility they have. Now with that quick claim deed filed, they're able to get the electricity back on, the lights on, and rent it out. So there are some unsuspecting renters out there that are renting property from somebody that doesn't even own the property, send them a check every month and in good faith. So we're not going, it's it's not the people that, that have been basically sucked into renting these properties not knowing what's going on. It's the guys that when they file that false document, or in the case of the, the one person that was in jail, and through the internet was able to download bankruptcy documents and put a forging a district attorney signature, put a district attorney in bankruptcy. When they file those bankruptcy documents and knowingly make false statements of the records, that's when they have committed the felony. And this is statute is to give them a clear charge to charge them under. Okay, I'm just just wanting to as I read this, the you know knowingly file, enter, record any document in a public record or court of the state of the United States, um, knowing or having reason that such document is false or contains false information or representation. Um, so that's, so again, as you, as you well know, what we, what we do is we, we understand the author's intention mm -hmm. and we look at the, the boundary cases to make sure that even the boundary cases there's not a boundary case that could exist that that doesn't warrant appropriate treatment under the, the penalty. So, as I read this, and again, f forgive me for not having um, you know, studied and vetted this and spent 45 minutes researching this before here. I'm just as I read this, um, this is a to, to me this on its face appears to be a felony statute for falsifying a document, um, and there's not a there's not a requirement to falsify a document and occupy a house or receive um, payments um, for falsifying the document. I'm trying, trying to understand the threshold case. Um, if someone were to just falsify a document but not carry out the remainder of what you've described, does that still get felony treatment? Yes, yes, it would because because if, a lot of the time they're not occupying the house because they're actually renting it out. Uh, you know, we you, know, you wouldn't put in there all the. I mean. You, Everything they could possibly do with the property would be such a litany of things that when they actually have tried to, to abscond with the possession for whatever they're going to do with it by falsifying the documents when they've, they've th crossed that threshold. What's the, what's the statute for, I'm just thinking parenthetically here, Mr. Chairman, I mean, I just, by comparison, what's the, what, what frameworks do we have in existing law for falsified documents, felony versus misdemeanor? And th th this is a this is a different flavor of a falsified document, mm -hmm. and I understand if someone falsified a document and carried out a scheme where they're receiving nine hundred dollars a month rent for a house, that stacks up over time. That could be a theft, or we ought to make it a theft that that meets the felony threshold. I'm just trying to get my mind around the way it's structured. Is there a question in there? <laughs> well, there is. I, I just to, to me it looks like if I know if someone knowingly files any document in the public record. Knowing that it's materially false, it's a felony. If I understand the question, I think the question really is, do we have any sort of precedent in the law right now for filing a false document that, that, that arises uh, yeah. rises to a felony? Counsel? Yes, we do. Under 161010 and under 161071, okay. they're felonies punishable by one to five. And that's for filing any kind of docu false document? or. So, so, so the default filing a false document, I say default, the, 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 the big bucket that most things fall into, as it were, for filing false document is a felony? Yes. Okay. And, what, there are, and there are parallels in the federal, in federal law as well. Is there a misdemeanor filing a false document in code? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Grabling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> 
Correct me if I'm wrong, district attorney is classified as a law enforcement officer, correct? Yes. And did, did you say just a moment ago that individuals have been known to forge a district attorney's signature? They, they did that. They, they There was actually, uh, as we were working on this bill, I was uh, told about a situation where a person in, in jail was able to get bankruptcy uh, filing uh, paperwork, forged the DA's signature, filed them with the clerk of the court, it took the DA four years to get three and a half years or so to get that straightened out because of the mess that a bankruptcy can cause. What's the current statute on impersonating law enforcement officer? It didn't apply to what happened to Ms. Kim because she happened because she was a DA by a criminal defendant that did it. So okay. put her in bankruptcy and had the people reasonable that didn't hurt her. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Packard. At the proper time, I would like to offer an amendment. All right. I see no further questions from members of the committee. Is there anyone present who is opposed to the substitute for House Bill 985? Seeing none, what's the pleasure for the pleasure of the committee? Ms. Dickerson moves due pass of House Bill 985 by substitute LC 295970S. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Pack. Are there any amendments, Mr. Pack? Thank you. I'd like to offer an amendment um, starting on line 41 at the end, starting towards this code and striking all the way down to 43. And the reason being is I think this language is redundant because it says sh this section shall not apply to an attorney who in good faith files a document when, when she or she believes that validity of the filing is supported by law. I think the intent element um, already existing in the language up in lines 29 to 36 already covers that and um, I think uh, adding that would actually confuse um, the prosecutors uh, partly because you can't really commit mortgage fraud without um, an attorney being present and they're the ones generally preparing the documents uh, and I don't want to make it easier for any attorneys engaged in this type of conduct to have uh, or even able to allege good faith. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? Council, are you clear on that? All in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Are there any, any, any further amendments? Seeing none, the question occurs on the motion of due pass by substitute LC 295970S. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Thank you. Mr. Tanner. House Resolution 1183, you have LC 286855. Mr. Tanner. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this also has a companion bill if the House passed the House Resolution 1183, which actually calls for a constitutional amendment. Uh, it also has House Bill 870 that would go along with that to place into law what would actually happen with the funds. Back in 1998, the General Assembly at the time uh, passed and the voters of the state of Georgia passed a constitutional amendment which created the Brain and Spinal Injury Trust uh, Fund Commission, which has been operating since that time. The money began to come in a few, uh, a couple years later. Uh, in that, it added a 10% surcharge to every DUI conviction fine, and that money went to the Brain and Spinal Injury Trust Commission uh, to fund various things to assist people who had been injured in accidents. And we know that DUI causes many of these accidents uh, that results in these injuries. Over the past few years, uh, they have saw the money that they're, that's needed to continue to go down. Uh, and one of the ideas that uh, we've brought forward to you today for consideration would be to extend the surcharge to reckless driving. Uh, those of us and, and those of you who've been involved in law enforcement or in prosecuting cases or defending cases know that many times the charge of reckless driving comes about as a result of a plea agreement uh, from a defendant who pleads down from DUI to reckless driving. Uh, and we've estimated some, some numbers. It's very difficult because the state doesn't keep up with the fine amounts that come in for reckless driving because those are paid into the individual communities. 
uh, but we do know there was around 10,000 or so convictions for reckless driving in the state in 2012, so it's a considerable number of people. Uh, I have with me Stephanie today from the Commission, and I'd like to, Mr. Chairman, if you would allow it for her to come up, and she has a brief presentation just to give the committee a good understanding of what this Commission does, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. That'd be fine. Let me ask just to confine it just to a few minutes, if you would. We have a long agenda. We have some bills that are stacking up, and that may take a little bit more time. So we're happy to hear from you, but let's, if we can, keep it abbreviated. is in place to serve Georgians who have suffered a traumatic brain or spinal injury. Traumatic meaning it comes from an outside force. Um, it's from a car accident, it's from a fall, it's from a bad football tackle, a shallow dive. Um, abuse, shaken baby syndrome is a form of traumatic brain injury. As Representative Tanner noted, the remittances for driving under the influence have plummeted. Um, our current monthly distribution budget is about $95,000. We used to award out over $2 million a year. Um, we currently have a two-month waiting list. When someone submits an application, they meet our criteria. You know, they've established U.S. citizenship. Um, we have, conf you know, we have affirmed that they are a resident of Georgia. We have confirmed their injury with, with a medical professional. Um, once they get through that process, whatever it is that they need, um, or that they are requesting a replacement wheelchair, vehicle modifications, et cetera. We're, at, we're having them wait two months for no other reason than we just don't have the funds available to distribute. Um, we have had to close our home modifications program recently for the rest of the fiscal year, home modifications being a ramp up to the house, um, trying to think what else, widening doorways, a wheelchair you know a lot of older homes have a much narrower doorway that a wheelchair cannot get through um, bathroom modifications roll-in shower that kind of thing um, so that is what the money is utilized for um, we've also had to cut a number of contracts we used to help out the brain injury sit well they helped us out with the Brain Injury Association of Georgia running a statewide information and referral line for people to call in and say, I need help with X, Y, Z, and we can no longer fund that. Um, is there anything? Well, I think it'd be, uh, you should note over on page, uh, the third page over, I believe, where it shows injury data. Uh, that shows you that the number of injuries have continued to increase and uh, as you can see on the page before that the amount of money coming into the fund has decreased I know the Commission had I believe approached the governor's office this year about uh, general appropriations for the first time but that you're running about what a quarter of a million dollars short in your budget uh, and of course that wasn't approved so this would be an alternative to looking at a general appropriations of funds in the budget uh, in a way to continue on the track of having those who commit those crimes to pay for the injuries uh, by extending this to reckless driving. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Questions for the author, Mr. Sessler. Thank you. Um, do you know what the average fine is for reckless driving today? Do you have a sense of that? No, I, I actually tried to get that information, but it, it's kind of across the board from a couple of hundred dollars up. It's uh, depending on jurisdiction. And the state, according to the House Research Office, doesn't track that information because it's done in each individual community, uh, in each individual court. So if it were, I'm just, just trying to put my, my, my mind around the numbers we're talking here. So if it's a, trying, trying to excel at fourth grade math here in my head. But uh, so if you've got 10,000 convictions a year, is that what we have in Georgia for, for reckless driving? That's roughly that in 2012, yes, sir. And, and, you're, and we're talking about 10% add on to that. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's 500 bucks a piece. Um, you know, as, as a fine, we'd be the, the add-on would be fifty dollars per per times ten thousand. Is, is, is that a half million dollars? Is that what that is? So we're talking about a half million dollar proposition. Is about the, the the scale of what you're talking about. Yeah, when we were trying to average it out, we we were looking at two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars on average for the fine. Because again, you have other issues, as you heard from Chairman Hamilton. A lot of folks may get convicted, and for whatever reason, if they serve their time in jail. 
et cetera, for other charges. They were not going to pay the pay the fine. So we averaged it out that if it was two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars uh, on average, ten percent of that would result in two hundred and fifty thousand to three hundred thousand dollars, which would fill the gap that they currently have in their budget. And this this is currently constitutionally earmarked dollars. Is it, that where we are? it is, and this would be a constitutional amendment that would change. Uh, basically just where it says under the influence of alcohol or drugs or reckless driving. So that would be up to the voters of the state if the General Assembly passed this to determine if they wanted to uh, make that one change in, in the current law. Yes, sir. <coughs> Further questions for the author? Seeing none, is there anyone here who would like to speak against House Resolution 1183? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Peck. House Resolution 1183, do pass LC 286855. There's a move due pass of HR 1183, LC 286855 by Mr. Peck, second by Ms. Dickerson, I think. Oh, it's Ms. Kendrick, I apologize. I was looking to my left. Um, are there any amendments? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Tanner. One question, Mr. Chairman. No. Okay. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I know when to run, but ha House Bill 870, since it's the companion bill that d dictates how this would be placed into law, mm -hmm. is that something that we need? H what's the process? You understand that much better than I do. Why don't we chat about that offline? Yes, sir. Um, after the meeting. Okay, thank you. Great. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is Mr. Strickland back? Mr. Strickland had a carryover from last meeting. Here he is. Uh, whatever works. That's fine. Excellent. We've carried over House Bill 845 from the last meeting. Uh, we had a good, vigorous conversation on that. And I think Mr. Strickland has been in discussions, and I think the, my sense is that, uh, subject to him uh, correcting us, that the result of that is the substitute that you have before you of LC 295973S. Mr. Strickland. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. For those who were not here at the last hearing, for those who were, we were discussing uh, mug shots and um, the issue we're continuing to see where these websites um, that are not legitimate media at all, but websites are putting up images of those that have been arrested and then charging for the takedown of those images. We're seeing folks that had a misdemeanor charge or had a case that was completely dismissed right away, use first offender, lots of stories, and their image stays online forever. They're applying for a job, they're working down the road, and they can Google their name, and, and there's the image where they're arrested. And so the first bill we had, 845, was, as I admitted last time, a little bit of overkill in the sense that it um, completely made all mugshots of someone that's not been convicted of a crime not subject to release to the public. And so as a matter of compromise and trying to find some narrow way, some way to walk this fine line between the public interest, having these images go, come out, and also um, taking on these website companies, we have the substitute here. And I believe, and I'll don't speak for anyone in the room. I think this substitute may be the compromise that will make those that were against the bill hopefully like it a lot better. Um, basically, what the substitute will do is it states the sheriff cannot post a mugshot image online. It also states the only way the mugshot image will ever be released is by a request from a media source who certifies in their request that the photo, let's see, make sure I say exactly right. That the photo would not be placed in a publication to a website and will not charge for removal and deletion of such photo from that website. In other words, they're not going to charge, they're not going to put it up online, charge to have it taken down. They'll actually certify that they're going to um, use the image that way, not going to use the image that way. And talking to my sheriff, I learned logistics of how this works. I know for my county, all of our mugshot images are uploaded online automatically. And then my sheriff let individuals from the media come and request images when they actually want the image for the newspaper. And um, this bill will make sure the only time an image is released is when there is a public interest, which will be defined by the media who will pick when there's a public interest. If they want to post this photo to the newspaper um, or, some, or put it on the news, they can do that. 
and chances are this will make it where only those that are public officials like ourselves or those that have been charged with more heinous crimes will actually the image ever come out. And um, there is a catch-all that will leave you, I think, any concerns anybody has about um, public safety still. And it's under 501877, there's a catch-all in the Open Records Act, which says that an arresting agency, a grand jury is a list of those that can still, despite what um, 501872 says, can still get these images where there's an investigation going on. So if there's ever an image that the sheriff still needs to release for some reason, an investigation, he or she can still do that through 501877. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer any questions. You may have just said this, Mr. Strickland, and I just missed it, but on line 17, the arresting law, enfor law enforcement agency shall not provide the photograph if, to a person requesting such photograph if such photograph may be placed in a publication. And then... Um, I guess the question is, is subsection D enough? I mean, those are pretty unsavory right. characters. They're willing probably to say or do anything thinking, okay, I'll sign the affidavit. And I think we, this will, we'll learn, at least we'll learn who it is requesting it. Right now, my understanding, most of these images are captured online without anybody ever actually making requests. This is, one, it's going to ensure that a sheriff is not going to be liable because it says how they know whether or not the image is going to be released, and that's under Section D. Someone has to certify. So mm -hmm. it goes back on the person requesting it. Mm -hmm. And I think through this, it's going to take a lot more effort for these companies to now come to Georgia um, when they're used to pulling these things offline around the country and request this, certify it. We're going to know who these folks are, and I'll be happy to bring another bill next year if we need to tackle this a little bit more. But I think this is, as far as I see, we can go without complete, completely excluding all images that someone or someone's not been arrested, someone's not been convicted. I appreciate it. I mean, my assumption is, but that may be a dangerous thing to do, that the access is, is it pretty uniformly all online? They're just getting whatever they can online, and then That's maybe they have runners or something that are going in and, you know, innocently asking for photographs. I don't think they have that. My understanding is, it's like, just my all county, electronic. everything's put online. Okay. As long as you're in my jail, your image is online right now. No, I mean, but the people, the They're entities requesting. that are requesting, it's all an online access. That's my understanding. It's not like they've got people running around. Right. Okay. Ms. Ballinger. Um, I did notice that um, you, know, you, you referenced basically that people would have to come to the state of Georgia, but there's no, um, I mean, you could technically submit a statement online. That's true. You'd have you to know, identify. So there's no, I mean, I could say I'm, you know, I, I could say I'm anybody. Um, and if I'm in Singapore, haha. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, what? I mean, what, what do we think about like a physical requirement that somebody show up, that they actually... I'm open to that. I just know that we have a lot of good media that is, I don't know if it's fair to make them have to go down to the jail every single time they want to get an image. Mm -hmm. um, I agree that there's still a way around this, mm -hmm. and we can change it to say in person. The first bill I had went a lot further. I'm fine with that, but I'm yeah. trying to walk the fine line here best I can. Yeah. I think this, at least we will, if for my share, for example, mm -hmm. start seeing these requests from someone who doesn't recognize. He knows who requests the images typically around Metro Atlanta, especially. Mm -hmm. And if he starts seeing these other people requesting it, he may start questioning that, and hopefully we'll learn about more about how these guys work by doing this. I, other states have tried different things. Utah tried a similar approach we have here last year. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is we'll be the second state in the country to try this, to actually go this far. And there's many states trying to figure out how to tackle these companies. I mean, can um, you speak of the efficacy of the Utah? I haven't seen any numbers on that. We okay. and In trying to find compromising language, we mm -hmm. found the Utah language. Mm -hmm. Me and representatives in the media uh, who have folks here today um, found that law they passed there. So I don't mm -hmm. know how it's worked there yet. Yeah. Um, Anytime you start saying who can and cannot have public record at that point, you have First Amendment issues. But here, you know, all you're making them do is certify somehow that mm -hmm. they're using it for legitimate media source. They're not going to violate the bill we passed last year, basically, is all we're trying to do. Um, so we could go further, but I, I think we start with this and mm -hmm. see if this helps. We'll know pretty quick if they're getting around this as well. And maybe next year we require something in person. 
Do the Georgia um, Sheriff's Association, do they support this bill? I have not got any. I don't want to speak for them. I think someone may be here from the sheriff's. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't speak for them. I will say that um, this idea, a lot of it came from my sheriff. Mm -hmm. And my whole purpose of having Section D is to give sheriffs the cover they need. So this, there's no liability on their part. I think this makes their job easier. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to, because right now they're kind of wondering how do I, they don't have to put them on line. They, a lot of them do because they feel like they need to, yeah. um, to play it safe. And so I think it gives them some cover and some, some consistency. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's going to add any workload to them at okay. all either. Okay. Mr. Coomer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, looking again at uh, subsection C, and uh, line 19, such booking photograph may be placed in a publication or posted to a website. Well, that, isn't that going to necessarily include every um, photograph that would be released? I mean, every photograph may be placed in a publication or posted. I mean, is that correct? Well, we have the and there on the end of line 19. You have to be both. You had to. Right. Every photo. Yes, you're right. What you're trying to ask is yes, every photo could be. That's why we have section D that just has them certify they're not going to do what's in lines 20 and 21. Well, and again, just dealing with paragraph C right now, what you're, what you're saying is that the arresting agency shall not provide the photograph if that photograph may be placed. So that's going to be every photograph. So, so subsection 1 is really kind of irrelevant. You look right. at subsection 2, removal or deletion of such booking photograph from such publication website requires a payment or, or of a fee or other consideration. How are you? How is the law enforcement agency going to know if number two applies? They will know if the person requests the image does not comply with section D. It, the bill is is meant to not have the sheriff have to make that decision. Um, the way a sheriff knows is if the statement is given to them in writing, as it says um, in section D there, and so. I don't want to have to add a burden to the sheriff to decide where his image is going to go. Because fact is, any image can end up on a website, period. And so the whole idea of this is to make it where the way they know is it's certified to them. And this, more than anything, this gets to the supply of the mugshots. Um, the media does not care uh, about most of your weekend arrests that happen. Um, the, the only cases they're really typically going to follow are those that are more high profile. And so this is going to make sure those the images that are going out the ones that are actually requested and um i i agree the sheriff's not going to know they're not supposed to know under this bill though well and i appreciate that after our last committee you you actually came and sat down and talked to me and, mm -hmm. and we had part of a discussion and we didn't get to finish but in looking at the utah law if i remember correctly doesn't the utah law simply provide for um the sheriff or, or the law enforcement agency to only provide the photograph if the person offers the statement. That's right. So what would be the, um, the problem with this legislation simply saying law enforcement will not provide unless the person gives the statement? Well, I think it does with more detail. I think it um, shows the policy we're setting. But I think it does that because we have uh, lines 22 and line 23. It says they shall submit a statement. And so if you want to read it all the way around, a sheriff cannot release an image unless there's a statement that is submitted. Um, so I think it does that. I think it just does it a little bit more detail. We're trying to be clear as to what we're trying to do here. The Utah law was, was a little bit shorter, and I think this kind of spells out more the policy we're trying to set here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kendrick. All right. Mr. Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm, I'm reading uh, line 19. So if a, if a newspaper, for example, which has a print edition and an online edition, um, wants to get images of folks that, that are arrested, they could be high-profile people, they could be people that committed big, ugly crimes that they think the pub public may want to see, um, they can... They can they can file the statement. They can place those photos on their website, on their online edition for the newspaper. Correct. Right. Okay. No, there's no prohibition for one of these these outfits who like to post photos up and require someone to pay to get them taken down. There, there's no prohibition for, from that outfit going to the Marietta Daily Journal's online website, pulling those photos off, 
posting them on their website and charging you to bring them down, correct? If they charge to have them taken down, this would they would not be allowed to do that. They could still post them online, um, but they could not charge the removal thereof. And I'm not trying to play you know, any tricks. I'm just trying to do good committee work. I, I mean, as, as I read this, the, the, the local law enforcement agency shall not provide a copy um, unless the person they're providing the copy to um, signs a statement saying, we, we promise we're not going to put it on a website and, and make folks pay to get it down. That's right. Okay. However, if they once once that leaves the hands of law enforcement and it's out there, whether it's a, a news agency, whether it's a community action group that wants to put it on their their website, what, whatever it is, once it gets out of the hands of law enforcement and is posted anywhere, then it's out there in the public space again, and people can grab that. You know, these I don't know if you call them the predators, but the people who make a buck on this, who these mm -hmm. bad actors we're looking to address, they can grab that with impunity, and there's no prohibition for them doing what they're doing because they're not getting it from law enforcement. It's only, it's, it's, it would only be those bad actors. You know, it seems like we're preventing the bad actors from getting it directly from law enforcement, but that's if right. it's available through any other means, there's no protection. And that's exactly right. That's why my first version, 845, went further. Um, but it was not going to pass. <laughs> there was not support for the first version that I could see. This is a compromise I have. Now, this is not going to stop. If you still have newspapers that go and request and certify to a share for every single image, that the sheriff has and then puts them online or puts them in a publication, these websites overseas are going to still get those images. But in counties like my county, we don't, our paper doesn't do that. Our paper doesn't request every single image. So I know in particular in my county, unless you are a high profile in a high profile case, your image is not going to these companies anymore. And so it's not a perfect fix. Um, so, but for those places that don't have newspapers that still publish every single image, which I'm being told is becoming a thing of the past, maybe it's not, but I'm being told that, then it's going to at least cut most of the supply down. It's not perfect. There'll still be a lot of supply going out there, but it's going to cut most of it down in counties like mine, at least. And Mr. Chairman, I just asked the question because it seems to me if there's any entity, and I sometimes I'm in, in gas stations in the, on the interstate and I see a little, little book sitting there by the cash register, and while you're waiting, you, you you flip through, they've got all the folks who've been arrested. Yeah. You know, if that's a website, then again, in practice, every single person that's arrested could still be up on a website. It's just that that, that might just be an intermediary for the folks that, w that want to take it, post it to their own site, and charge it again. It's it almost, I mean, it, it does create a speed bump, but I'm not sure that it stops what we're trying to do. I, and I know you, your intention was to try to do that initially. I agree. It does not stop it completely, but I think it's the biggest speed bump I can get right now. Um, I mean, we, we passed House Bill 150 last year that Representative Bruce brought, mm -hmm. which was another big speed bump. It made it illegal. We um, voted to make this these kind of acts illegal. You can't legally go and post a mugshot online and charge for removal once someone is requesting writing to have that image taken down and shows that they have not been convicted or used first offender or pled no low, several things there. Um, it's illegal for the companies that didn't charge. They're still doing it. Um, that was a good speed bump because some companies stopped. But we're having trouble now enforcing that law with all these companies that are now overseas. And so this is another speed bump. And the, the alternative is to completely um, get rid of mugshots altogether. Folks have not been convicted completely, had those not out there. That's one thing you could do. Or you can put another speed bump here and still try to allow the legitimate media, as I keep calling, but the actual media, still give them access. And I think this will really cut down the supply. My hope is these companies will target our states more than Georgia now because we will go right there with Utah. They're probably the first thing by the country has gone with this. With this Mr. Atwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, can you give me the LC number you're working off of? LC 29-5973-S. Yes. Uh, I apologize. I, had to, I didn't have the full committee here today. <laughs> I understand. Uh, That is correct. That's part of the bill. Okay. Uh, I know as, as often in the past in common practice, the law enforcement agencies could post a photograph that was taken at, during the booking process uh, when that person flees, if they right. were murdered or something. Uh, 
you may have already addressed it. I did. Just no, it's okay. I did. That's a great question. That was one of the first things that I thought of too. And 501877 is another part of the code under the Open Records Act, which is a catch-all that allows an arresting agency, a grand jury, there's a several lists on the code in front of me, several folks there that can, despite what 5018 um, says all the way around and what we say here in 35118, they can still get those images as part of an investigation. And so if there's someone that is booked in and goes and pleads out and runs away, which happens a lot, at that point a sheriff has every right in the world to upload that image. And so he could still post that. That's right. The public be on the lookout for it. That's right. Thank you. Mr. Grabley. The way I read the bill, thank you for your work on everybody involved. The way I read the bill is these overseas companies or these, these magazine companies no longer have carte blanche access to the databases to just download all these images. That's right. To your point even further, Chairman Sessler, is the ones they are going to have access to once they leave the law enforcement office, are the law enforcement office agency or uh, department are the ones that the legitimate news have requested through affidavit. So, and, and the legitimate news agencies, outlets or whatnot, are only requesting those that are sp story specific. So, it, it really puts the it's a deterrent that these overseas companies are not going to be able to just download these entire ones. So it makes them work harder. That's right. And if they only have access to the ones that the news media are doing on for, that are story specific, they're going to be less inclined to really go after three or four over a weekend or a week that these agencies have posted. Correct. That's right, and there may still be some exceptions. There are still a few counties that have every mugshot posted in their newspaper, mm -hmm. and it, that newspaper now must go request those individually still, and they may do by that. But yeah, by affidavit, every cut, one, correct. Right, it should cut off most. There will still be places where, this, where they do get uploaded online, but it should cut off most of those images. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Coomer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me another bite at this apple. Um, I want to kind of follow up on what Representative Atwood was asking first, and that is about um, a law enforcement agency being prohibited from putting a mugshot on its own website uh, or, or on some service that may be uh, used for finding a person who has, who has fled. Um, and I look at Section 2 and re recognize that this is an exception to um, – the disclosure provisions of the Open Records Act, so they're not required to be, these records are not required to be disclosed. Um, and the way I'm reading it is the Sheriff's Office still could not put the photograph on their own website for, for getting out to media uh, or the public the identity of a person that they may be searching for. Is that correct? They still could if, they, if it's part of an investigation. It's very, it's a catch-all, and I also have a Dusty Pullman. Um, uh, Jill is over there. Good. <laughs> okay, so there's a separate code section. So how does that allow a law enforcement officer or agency to post a booking photograph of someone on their website when this language in, in, in the Section 1 says they can't do that? Because Section 1 is not part of the 50-1872. Um, the it's part of Title 35. So... Yeah. Under Section 4 there, in the lines 29 through 37, um, booking photos are still considered records there. It just draws your attention to the very end, another code section where those records are further regulated. It's based on my understanding, Jill, you probably speak better than I can on this. And then under 501877, it says, despite 501872, um, those images can't come out for an ongoing administrative, criminal, or tax investigation. It lists out... Um, state or federal grand jury, taxing authority, law enforcement agency, or prosecuting attorney can all request under that section. I understand I understand what you've read to me. There may be more than I've heard so far, but even in what you've read to me, it does not say that 
there is an exception to 35-118. It says there's an exception to 50-18-72 under open records. It does not say that if there's an ongoing investigation, you can ignore 35-118 and post the image to the website. So I don't think, just reading it, I don't think that, that you've left open an opportunity for law enforcement to use the Internet to assist in searches for uh, fugitives from justice. The other part of it that, I, that gives me some concern, again, with the arresting or law enforcement agency or an agent of that agency not being able to put, uh, post a booking photograph on a website is there are some laws that require um, these photographs to be made public, uh, like the sex offender registry. I think if you have a second DUI, there's a, a requirement that those photographs be made. Uh, I don't know if they're required to be posted online, but I think that's where they usually are done. So would we be creating uh, – are we, are we telling the sheriff's offices that they can no longer follow that procedure in dealing with sex offender registry and DUI uh, defendants? Uh, and, in, and if so, aren't we then going to be doing a disservice to the people in our neighborhoods who actually pull those things up and look at them online because it's convenient and easy to do that? Yeah, and that um, is not the intent at all. It, it, I'll defer to Ms. Travis, but I'll, if we could reference um, 501877 directly in 35118, if that would make you feel better, we could directly reference that. or And also put something that says, or otherwise required by law, that would capture those images that have to be posted otherwise. And so something vague that still allows a sheriff to post it when they're required to post it. And we make clear, I think the current draft still does that. If you look, um, it, and where we amend 501872, it's implied there that a booking photograph is a record that's referenced there and then under 501877 it references back to that section again but to make it clear I know exactly what you're saying to make it clear I think we could probably unless until otherwise um, reference that code section under 35118 too maybe we will temporarily suspend temporarily suspend consideration of 845 pending a meeting of the minds maybe yep. on that so we can keep the agenda going if we by the time the meeting ends get to the point where we think we've struck consensus fine if we have not then we'll reserve the right to carry over for tomorrow we do have a, a meeting scheduled for tomorrow given that we're approaching day 30 rapidly we have a room reserved um, for the two bills that were postponed from the regular agenda today and whatever may spill over from today so we have that option so let's go ahead and do that just in Thank the interest of, of, of time and let me call mr. Powell for house bill 777 thank you mr. chairman and uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee I bring to you uh, HB 777, LC number 5963S. This is a uh, cleaned up version from the one that came out of the, uh, the subcommittee. And uh, if I might, just sort of let me give you a background on this. Last year, the uh, those legislators on the eastern side of the state formed the Savannah River Water Basin Caucus. Our colleagues on the South Carolina side did the same. We have had quite a amount of success of the two states working together on issues, from water issues to uh, just a variety of things. In the fall of the year, we had a uh, meeting where we had both governors, both lieutenant governors, both DNR commissioners. One of the things came out of this, uh, thanks to the DNR uh, presence there, was a need for a uh, voters for an interstate boating violator compact. And that's what you have in front of you today. Uh, quite frankly, the gist of it is that uh, it allows the two states or any other states that wish to join into this compact. It's based on the same model of uh, the uh, driver's licensing compacts as well as uh, I believe this I'm like the hunting like and violator. fishing violator compacts. So that if a Georgia resident is over in another state and they have a and they 
occur a violation, they won't have to appear in court immediately or post a bond. They can do a, a recognizance, a signed their recognizance bond. Well, I apologize for interrupting. Gentlemen, if we could uh, direct our attention to this bill. Thank you. The, um, the language in Section 1 and 2 deals with uh, the departments of the other states that they may suspend uh, voting privileges of a citizen if the citations have not been cured. If you go back to the other state and cure that citation, then it will be sent back to the, to the receiving state, and then they can do the same. Uh, Section 3 uh, basically establishes this interstate voting violator compact. Uh, Article 2 is your definitions. Uh, the findings is in Article 3, Declaration of Policy and Purposes. Uh, Article 4 is the procedures for the issuing state of issuing the citations uh, and the transmissions to the issuing states. Uh, procedures for the home state is in Article 5. Uh, reciprocal recognition of these suspensions is Article 6. Uh, applicability of other laws. And then we get into the compact administrative procedures. Uh, it says we said this is based on uh, the hunting and fishing compact laws that we have with other states. This this arrived here primarily through DNR, correct? It did. Okay. Is there a first thing I thought of is is there an accompanying cost to? No, sir. There's already a database that's been put together to hold this information. Mm -hmm. The same company, the, it's a volunteer group actually, that puts together our wildlife violator compact information. So the repository for that is already in place. The structure's in place. Just the same officer that would be entering our current wildlife violator compact information would also enter this in. You know, currently within our state, we probably have a little over 2,000 individuals whose voting privileges in state are suspended. So we've already got all those structures in place. Okay. I should ask for a report from the subcommittee chair if there is one. Mr. Setzler, do you have anything to add? Okay. Questions from members of the committee for the author or from our uh, friends at DNR? Seeing none, uh, is there anyone who'd like to be heard in opposition to House Bill 777? Mr. Ramsey, one. Sure. Has there been any discussion with other states? Is yes, there sir. is there yes, similar sir. bills winding their way through and adjoining? State of South Carolina passed this uh, passed their version out last week out of committee, and it's supposed to be on the floor of the South Carolina House this week. So theoretically, we'd be the first two states in the compact, and then you'd start talking to your colleagues in other uh, yes, natural resources department. Yes, sir. Country. And there is a National Association of Boating Law Administrators that started looking into this in 2007. So there is a lot of interest already out there. Just this would be the impetus to help move that forward as a nationwide type compact. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Pack. <coughs> on, on Article 8, I think it's page 8, this has the kind of the... Um, the administrative procedures. How is the first administrator going to be selected? Uh, excuse me. The, it, it looks like each state will have an administrator assigned. Yes. I'm assuming that's going to be a. Um, going to be a. There'll be an entity, I guess, that's created. Basic. That basically, the, the administrator will be designated by our DNR board under our rules and regulations, and that will be. Same officer that we currently have that's the administrator is our for our wildlife violator compact. Okay, where where does it say that that the DNR board will would designate this person? I think that's the last the last section, Jim. I don't have a current copy. Oh, okay. I see. Three or four. Three or four. I got it. Thank you. Any further questions from members of the committee? Mr. Sussel moves due pass of House Bill 777 by substitute LC 
5963S, second by Ms. Ballinger. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you for your patience, Chairman Powell. Thank you. Mr. Lumsden, House Bill 720. Thank you for your patience. While Mr. Lumsden is coming over, let me acknowledge Judge Wes Taylor from Fulton County State Court. Judge Taylor, are you here? Already fled. You can't blame him, really. <laughs> yeah. I understand. No, I, I agree. <laughs> Mr. Lumsden, thank you again for your patience. It's that time of year. It is. Fire away. Good afternoon. I'm bringing to you House Bill 720. Uh, we have a substitute uh, re reference LC295952 ERS. Uh, this is a bill that deals with technology, officer safety, clerical efficiency, funding, and local control. Uh, technology, as we all know, is a driver of many things in our world today, and uh, the use of new technology is often beneficial, but it always comes at a price. Uh, most of you are perhaps more familiar with an officer writing a ticket on a carbon-based uh, multi-copy ticket. Uh, I did that for 30 years as a state trooper. But the bill I bring to you today is one that would uh, help all local police agencies in Georgia have the uh, opportunity to employ newer technology and reap the benefits that it provides. Uh, the electronic citation system is a proven technology that uh, is already in use by the Georgia State Patrol, the Department of Natural Resources, and many larger police agencies across our state. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the system, uh, let me give you a brief overview. Uh, the system uh, uses a handheld computer device, uh, slightly larger than a cell phone. It has uh, scanner capabilities and drop-down categories to populate uh, information onto a citation. Uh, the printed copy is produced uh, for the violator by an in-car printer, and the citation can then be transmitted to the uh, appropriate courts. Uh, this is first and foremost an officer safety bill. The longer an officer is on the side of the uh, road with a traffic stop, uh, the greater risk he is, uh, greater are his or her chances of being injured or killed. Uh, the use of uh, this system reduces uh, the amount of time an officer spends on a traffic stop by almost 50 percent. Uh, the average time it takes an officer to complete a routine, routine traffic stop with a handwritten citation is about 16 minutes. Uh, with an e citation, the um, average time is about nine minutes. Uh, because the system is electronic, it also eliminates uh, legibility issues with citations uh, both for the violator and the courts. Uh, this also eliminates uh, the possibility of dismissed tickets because of handwriting errors. Um, instead of a paper citation uh, having to be sorted physically carried to and physically carried to multiple courts and scanned or manually fed into the court data system, uh, you can transmit the citation directly to the courts just like you send an email, and this would represent a great savings in manpower. Now, while this system has a great many benefits, uh, the reality is that for the uh, mid-sized and smaller agencies around our state, uh, the cost of implementing and maintaining new technology is a challenge to local government budgets. As a county commission chairman for several years myself, I can also attest to that firsthand. House Bill 720 provides a local approach to implementing and maintaining an electronic citation system. Local governments who want to embrace this technology will have a method for making that happen. This bill permits local governing bodies to authorize the clerk of courts to collect a fee of up to $5 for the purpose of creating a fund to be used solely for implementing and maintaining an electronic citation system. Local governing bodies can implement the process by passing a local resolution and they control the amount necessary to collect each year uh, by a similar act. So in summary, this bill permits local governments by an act of local legislation to authorize the clerk of courts to collect a technology fee of up to $5 to be used to establish a fund for implementing and maintaining the electronic citation systems administered by the local governing authority. This is for officer safety, clerical efficiency, provides for funding, local control, and reporting procedures. I have coordinated my efforts on this bill with the ACCG, GMA, the Sheriff's Association, Chief of Police, Clerk of Courts, and the Prosecuting Attorney's uh, Council, as well as a subcommittee in which uh, the um, uh, uh, House uh, sub uh, substitute that you have before you uh, came about. So I uh, thank you for your time and your attention. Uh, I would appreciate your support, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. I think there will be a, a question or two. Let me recognize the subcommittee chair if he has a report. 
Hey, Mr. Chairman, this was uh, um, this was a jewel in the crown of uh, Vice Chairman Pack's legislative package this year. He um, this this was a I, I say that jokingly. Representative Pack had had some concerns uh, from his county that I think uh, Representative Lumsden um, addressed very very nicely in subcommittee. Um, there was good debate. I will tell you, there's three changes substantively made in subcommittee. I think Representative Lumsden was very accommodating to, to include. Um, one was to ensure the governing authorities, the resolution that, that levies this $5 add-on would have to be done each year, I think, to, to make sure this doesn't become something that just rolls over from year to year. Um, there was a, a, a five-year sunset put on it in subcommittee uh, so that this would expire in 30 June 2019. And also, there's a language in here that could could be redundant with respect to the, the, the right for a citizen to take action if the fees are being collected and not used specifically for the narrow purpose of this system specifically. But there's some scope creep. Hey, let's go buy some new tough books for the officers. Let's go buy computers that would allow a citizen, a voter within the area um, that the the uh, this, this add-on's being levied to be able to bring case in Superior Court if they felt like the fee was being misapplied and it had become a slush fund, mm -hmm. that they would have standing in court to, to, to try to ensure that dollars are being used appropriately. So I think those those are very thoughtful um, changes that, that Representative Lunsden was very accommodating to include. So, so it came forward with the, with, with the DuPass recommendation. Thank you for the report. I appreciate it. Questions for the author, Ms. Ballinger. Um, hey. Uh, Representative Lumsden, I do appreciate you bringing this legislation, and you and I talked extensively about this um, earlier. My only question is the governing authority. Um, you know, in, in Cherokee County, we have a lot of city courts. Um, say, for example, if you get arrested in the city of Woodstock, you request a jury trial on your DUI, it automatically gets pumped up to our state court in Cherokee County. What happens if the city court has authorized the fee, but the county has not? The, the, the county would not have the authority to collect the fee, correct? The legislation indicates that the authorizing uh, governmental entity, you know, authorize, mm -hmm. governmental entity authorizes that. So whatever court that might be in, uh, I, I guess I would have to defer to legislative counsel on that particular issue. But in my, my thought process, it's still collected mm -hmm. uh, because it was authorized by the um, – how, uh, how does the city have authority over the county to mandate a fee? I, I, if you've got an answer. Okay, so even if Woodstock had not mandated the fee, then it would still apply if it were adjudicated in the in our in our state courts, as opposed to. If Woodstock had, but the county has not. Once mm -hmm. it went to the court of county level, then the ability to levy that would not be applicable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if Woodstock had, but then it, you know you appeal for a jury trial or whatever, and it it goes up to state court, then you wouldn't be able to to collect the fee. Mr. Hightower. All right. Mr. Gravely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Representative Hightower had a good question at our at one of our subcommittee hearings about the specs uh, required on, for a citation size. And I believe the author, uh, you you actually, DDS cleared that up for us, correct? We went, we went to DDS with the question, and they uh, got the answer for us, and there was no action necessary uh, to be taken to make any changes that that, that had already been addressed okay. through DDS. I see no further questions. Are there any uh, witness, uh, potential witnesses who would like to be heard against House Bill 720? Anyone opposed or concerned? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Setzler moves due pass of House Bill 720 LC 29. 5952 ERS, second by Mr. Coomer. Are there any amendments, Mr. Pack? 
<clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on line 87, I know this provision was put in there um, to give standing uh, for a voter to bring an action. I, I, I think we probably need to specify what relief because it's for uh, limited to an injunctive relief instead of a damages. So I, I propose after the word, word Superior Court 2 and insert the word seek appropriate injunctive relief in order to ensure it in the rest of the language that's existing. Let me ask counsel if she has that or has any questions or concerns. Okay. Let me ask Mr. Okay. Pack to repeat his amendment for so the committee. I'm not sure what you're saying, the construct in 1521204. Okay. I don't have any question about representing Pack, but I think that makes good sense. Okay. Let me ask Mr. Pack to repeat it if you would. After the word two in uh, Superior Court two, insert, insert, seek appropriate injunctive relief in order to. Then, rest of the language. Okay. Discussion on the amendment? I see no questions on the amendment. All in favor of the PAC amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have, and the amendment is adopted. Are there any further amendments? I do. Round two. Mr. Pack. Uh, line 90, uh, there was discussion about the length of the, the sunset period. Um, I would like to offer an amendment changing the June 30, 2019 date to 2017, which would be three years. Because um, the reason I say that is that I don't see any fee taxes or credits we ever offer in the General Assembly to offer longer than three years, especially where the imposing jurisdiction has the power to drive up the volume. Um, I think that, that sunset's necessary for them to come back to seek authorization. I think that's good government. So I request that the uh, number nine be stricken and insert the word, uh, insert the number seven. Let me ask the author if he has any comment on that. This bill was structured primarily to give our midsize and smaller counties across the state an opportunity to be able to access technology. I think by doing this it limits the likelihood that that's going to happen uh, with our smaller governmental entities because they don't generate the kind of revenue that some of our larger counties do regarding this and the cost of implementation. Um, you know, in some of these counties it would take three years of collecting fees along the lines of what they currently do in order to be able just to implement, uh, uh, just to get it up and running. That was my question about and three years sounds like a reality, lot of time, but sometimes in, it's in, not. In reality, having been on the county commission, if you pass a law at the state, it may be a year or two before the concept really gets through to the commissioners, and then they start really thinking in terms of, oh, this is something that might be of benefit to us. So I just think that's too short of a time. I think the five years... Frankly, I would like to see it longer than the five years, but I, you know, um, acquiesced to that in order to try to get a uh, bill that we can uh, move forward with. Understood, Mr. Gravely. I think I think the discussion we had during the subcommittee was based upon the fact that our locally elected officials, our county commissioners, our city council mayors, are on four-year terms. True. So that the the three-year may have been a little bit too not enough time for us to determine whether or not this was actually working in one of those those local municipalities or county governments and the five year was a compromise correct me if i'm wrong did we have seven on there we had talked about seven then we talked about three and we kind of met in the middle sure we, we did discuss some different options uh, yeah, I, I will tell you that um um i, I think I can't speak for every member of the subcommittee, but there was a sensitivity to the the, the enrollment time. It, it takes time to go through a couple chiefs of police meetings or ACCG meetings and find out what other folks are doing, kind of get your mind around this, get it prepped. Um, we, we wouldn't want folks to have it 
just as soon as they kind of figure out this is a mechanism that's available to them, have it be sunsetted and, and for whatever reason not happen. Yeah, my take is if it's, you know, on its merits, if it's a bad idea, then let's just not do it. But if it's a good idea, let's at least give it five years to have a chance to do something. That was really kind of the discussion in subcommittee. Okay. Good dialogue. Any further comments on the PAC amendment, Mr. PAC? Did you? Have, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you would press again. Did you have something? Yes. Uh, Legislative Council pointed out that line 89 and 90 is repeated in lines one of one, line 104. So if the amendment passes, we need to correct line 104 as well. Do you want to amend your amendment to whether? Would be appropriate to have those separated out, or if, if it passes, yeah. I'll, I'll move for the second amendment to strike one okay. more. All right. Any further discussion on the pack amendment to on line ninety to strike two thousand nineteen and insert two thousand seventeen? Seeing none. All those in favor of the pack amendment signify by raising your hand. Opposed. And the amendment, the amendment fails. Are there any other further amendments? Seeing none, the underlying question is the motion of do pass by substitute of House Bill 720 LC 295952 ERS. Mr. Setzler. Um, this, this is an administrative thing. Mm -hmm. I, it may relate to what council asked. Um, do we need to just strike 89 and 90 since the uh, repeal date is stated in, on 103 and 104? Is that what you were suggesting, council? Trying to get a clarification. Okay. No, I appreciate it. <coughs> All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Lumpson. Thank you. Mr. Strickland, how, how do we look? I think we look good. <laughs> that's, of course, and, that's and an eye of the beholder determination, I isn't a, it? I haven't been to Amir in a little while. It's a very subjective <laughs> determination. I think you'd the, agree. Miss um, Travis has a markup. I think she will share with the committee. I believe I met with some folks outside, um, Terry as well, the Sheriff's Association. I think this is a language that will ensure that we are referencing that code section, um, which I'll have in front of me, Section 77. I'll let Ms. Travis, if you will, read it. <laughs> um, on line 15, before the word and, insert, except as provided in code section 50-18-77 and the requirements of publication of booking photographs as set forth in Title 15, comma, and the rest being law enforcement to continue on. We're just adding the exception at the beginning saying, Hey, everybody, don't forget about your exceptions that you already have in 77. And also, there is some language ex excerpts in the code for the booking photographs that uh, Representative Coomer mentioned relative to um, the publication that goes out when certain people are convicted of crime. But they, and it actually does say there, there's a photograph taken at arrest. So that's a good cross reference to bring in, to be clear. L let me ask Mr. Coomer if he's at peace with that. Mr. Atwood. Funny, I was sitting here thinking about the same thing. I'm a little concerned about some of my smaller police departments having access to legal counsel and Terry can prove that when they sit and look and say an arresting law enforcement agency shall not post booking photographs on the website. Thing I thought about going in the exact same place and uh, love the rest of the committee to discuss this. Something simple and clear, except as pursuant to and be on the lookout below request placed by an investigative law enforcement agency, an arresting law enforcement agency shall not post a photograph. Uh, I'm concerned about them able to go back and look at that particular section and discern that they can't, they can or they cannot do that. But I'm, to me, what Ms. Travis has is perfectly fine. I just have a little concern that there are smaller agencies that don't have access. 
are going to be able to understand that. Well, I mean, would their city attorney navigate them through that? I would have. But it, I, I tell you, I think her language is fine. We can obviously come back, revisit it. If sure. We need to, if we have some complaints from here, maybe yeah. we'll work them out. Okay. Let me ask Ms. Travis to, to read that back one one time. We'll we'll consider this. Well, you know what? Let's let's do this. L let me go ahead and take a motion on eight forty five, and then we'll do it in the nature of an amendment offered by the by the author, and then we'll. Mr. Pack moves do pass HB eight forty five by substitute LC twenty nine five nine seven three S. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Atwood. Any amendments, Mr. Strickland? Yes. On line 15, section B before the word and, add except as provided in code section 501877 and the requirements of publication of booking photographs as set forth in Title 16, comma. Any discussion, any further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Coomer. Just one, one question really to council. Is the sex offender registry in Title 16? Uh, it is not. The sex offender registry is in Title 42, and I searched the word publication for Title 42, and it didn't come up. I will double check that. I don't think that the photographs are published over there. Chair, would you like me to take the time to make sure we reference the right sections here and bring this back? Let's do that. We're coming back on adjournment tomorrow. It's going to be in 403, 403 um, of the Capitol. It'll be first out of the gate and uh, just out of an abundance of caution. Let's do that and make sure we cross our T's on that. Yep. Is, that is it on the language that we're talking about right now? Or is there a separate issue? No, we don't want any confusion on that. No. Thank you for those no. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's take a time out on that, and we'll take the time necessary, and that'll be first up tomorrow, assuming that we're we're ready to go. We'll be adjourned until tomorrow, um, Mr. Setzler. I, I just want to ask ask one last question for Mr. Strickland from members of the committee. I, I 
I'm not. I, I have a concern, Mr. Chairman, that, uh, and I know Mr. Strickland wants to get something done for some as opposed to overreach that might not apply that he could lose. I'm just concerned that what's proposed, and I'll find out perhaps, perhaps from Mr. Strickland, I think it's appropriate to talk about it in full committee. I don't know who's opposed to the more the, the stronger approach that Mr. Strickland wanted to take. I'm concerned the effect of what we have here is as follows. If your local newspaper pulls all the photos from these things as a matter of practice and posts them, then you get you don't get the protections of this. You get your stuff downloaded by these 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 bad actors and your stuff's posted and you have to pay to get it down. If your local newspaper chooses not to pull this information, then you get a protection that somebody in another area doesn't get. Now, in terms of how the law equally applies, what the, the hinge of this entire bill doesn't hinge on what the General Assembly says, doesn't hinge on what local governments vote to do or what a sheriff does. It hinges on whether a local news source chooses to file and pull down information on on people who've been charged in their communities. I mean, the whole, the, the, the whole, the whole, all the negative. All, all the negative consequences that come from it, from this stuff getting out there and getting grabbed by these sites and, and, and kept forever until you pay to get it down um, will all hinge on whether a local news source files one of these affidavits and puts it up on their website or makes it publicly available. And so to me, the hinge on this is something that's just as is, is chaotic as what your local news source and their own whim chooses to do. But that, that, that's the effect of what we have drawn. To me, we ought to put protections in here that may be harder for Representative Strickland to fight through, but I think this committee can certainly help him make the lift to get it done. Because I don't think he wants to provide his, the, 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 the relatively modest protections this bill provides for, for, from, from our own discussions. He, he'd like, he wants it to be stronger. But I just have real concerns that we pass a bill that really hinges on a whole category of people will get protection because of the whim of their no local newspaper versus someone else. I'll say this in closing. Um, what we pursue is that we run a very open process, exceedingly open. So I think what I'd say in quasi response to Chairman Setzler's comment is that um, that there's no proposal out there that just automatically, I think, um, would be entertained with an open mind by the committee as a whole. That's just not talking about the chair by the committee as a whole. Um, that is not to say to persuade or to dissuade on any particular approach. Candidly, that's the that's the prerogative of the author. Um, that's what it comes down to. I think he's heard one member of the committee. Um, there are several, but it's something to think about going into uh, going into a motion uh, tomorrow. Again, that is not to persuade or dissuade, but I haven't heard anything that's prejudicial one way or the other. Candidly, and Mr. Mr. Chair, I ask that question simply because I know. Many of his peers are passing bills that get 166 to zero votes. I don't know if the, the goodness of a bill is um, measured on an un, unobstructed run to the end zone. You might need to take some hits. But I think it's an important subject matter. And you may not get consensus from everybody. You may have a bill that has to get a, a seven to four vote coming out of this committee. And, and, but I just I think my concern is this all hinges on something that is is as seemingly random as the whims of a newspaper. Or that hey, the person that's that's been accused happens to be the child of a judge, or happens to be a high school principal, or a, or a popular coach. Their stuff gets out there because they're a popular coach, and the newspaper wants to know about them, and they get loaded to this website. Um, but other folks don't. It just seems that, that it hinges on something that's not um, a, 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 po a definitive action of, of a ruling. Kind of really I have to think the author is going to let that roll through his mind. <laughs> More than he wants to between now and tomorrow. We'll be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.